Today we're taking a deep dive into the air reverb on a Kai Force and MPC. Now, I'm not here to convince you against your will that I think this reverb is better than whatever your favorite reverb is. It's a little bit older plugin. It started its life as the core reverb effect in Pro Tools. On the whole, I think this is still a really nice reverb, and it's obviously what's available to us on the Force and the MPC. It can usually do what I need it to do, and it can sound really nice. It's capable of creating a wide range of reverb sounds, although its main strength is modeling physical spaces. And if you take some time to get to know it, I think you might find it's actually better than what you thought it was. Hi, my name is Joe. Welcome, and thanks for hanging out with me today. Now, I have to admit, it took me a while to get my head around this reverb and to get the results that I wanted. A big part of the reason that I struggle with it is that it's actually pretty complex. It has nearly 20 parameters that you can adjust, and it only has about twice that many presets. Many of those were added fairly recently. While some of the parameter names seem intuitive, others left me guessing about what it is that they're actually doing. And unfortunately, the user guide has precious little to say about any of the parameters. And many of these controls are actually very powerful once you know what they do. So today I'm gonna share with you what I've learned about this reverb. We'll look at the different sections of the reverb, which controls belong with which sections, and how the sections do and don't interact with each other. We'll take a deep dive into individual parameters and investigate what they do, along with some sound examples, of course. I'll share the mental maps that I use when tweaking the controls with you. Then we'll bring it all together and I'll show you my approach for using all of these controls to craft a custom reverb sound for a given instrument or mix. My hope is that by the end of this video, you'll feel confident about dialing in custom sound settings with the Air Reverb so that you aren't reliant on using only the factory presets. You'll be creating the reverb sound that you want from scratch. If you're not already wearing your headphones, you might want to go ahead and grab some since we'll be listening to some nuanced sound differences today. All right, let's get our verb on. All right, I'm going to be demoing this with a piano sound just because um, it's a sound we're all really familiar with and it won't be too distracting. It's also got a pretty wide frequency range. So for openers, we've got this mix control here, and this just controls the balance between the dry signal and the wet reverb signal. So if you've got this set up on a return track, uh, you're probably going to want to set this to 100%. If you've got this set up on your mains or on a channel track, you're probably going to want to adjust this mix somewhere. Um, and typically, I would probably in that case leave it, you know, somewhere below 50%. Um, I'm usually probably somewhere in the 5 to 35% range and then you start to get some reverb sound. So we're on the init patch here, and the reverb from a sound generation perspective is really divided up into three distinct sections, all of which are optional. So first we've got a pre-delay, and then after that pre-delay is done, we've got these early reflections, and after those early reflections are completed, then we move into the tail section of the reverb. So now we understand a bit about how that works, we can go and explore each section. So for starters, we've got this pre-delay control right here, and this is all by itself. It affects both things that could come after it, the early reflections and the tail, and it really just essentially puts a gap between your dry signal and the rest of the signal. So if we turn this all the way up, we're gonna hear a gap. So the idea behind this pre-delay is that it is a physical space modeling tool. Let's say you're sitting in a room that is 100 feet long. And if you live pretty much anywhere in the world except for the United States, that's um, roughly 30 meters. And let's say you have a performer at one end of the room and maybe it's coming through some speakers. You're in the middle of the room. So it's gonna take a bit of time for the sound to travel from those speakers to you. And after it reaches you, it's gonna continue on past you and hit the wall behind you and the sound will reflect off of that wall and it will come back towards you from the other direction. And after a certain amount of time has passed, you'll hear that reflection. So this pre-delay is all about emulating that time between the time when the dry signal comes to you and when you first hear that reflection. Now sound travels at roughly 1,000 feet per second or maybe 300 meters per second if you're somewhere else. Um, those are really rounded off numbers. Those are nowhere near exact, but I'm just trying to give you a sense here. So, you know, if it's 50 feet from you to the back wall, then from the time that you first hear the dry sound, and when you hear that first reflection, the sound has to travel about 100 feet. So 
maybe about 100 milliseconds or so would be a reasonable value to emulate that. And that's what pre-delay does. That's the only control for a pre-delay. Next up, we've got this early reflection section. Uh, and there are three controls for it. Um, there's this ER tail mix, we've got the length control, and then we've got the type. So we'll start at the bottom here with this ER tail mix control. And this controls the mix between the early reflections and the tail, which is the third part of the signal. So if we go all the way to the left with this control, then all we're going to hear are the early reflections. There will be no tail. And if we go all the way to the right with this control 100%, we won't hear the early reflections at all. It will just be the tail. So since we're focused on the early reflections, let's bring this down to zero so that we're not hearing the tail at all and only these early reflections. I'm also gonna bring this pre-delay all the way up just so we can kind of hear these early reflections and what they sound like. So the, right now our type is set to small studio and if you listen to the second part of the signal as I do a quick hit. You can hear what the small studio early reflection sounds like. Now these early reflections, what they are, they are kind of like a multi-tap delay. It's a very, very short delay. We're talking about milliseconds here. And it's actually multiple taps. And those taps are, have, are at different times and they're at different places within the stereo spectrum. So different pan amounts. And they're different for each of the types that we have here. And the idea behind this is that this creates a, kind of a sonic fingerprint or uh, maybe an impulse response, you could call it, for these different types of spaces, uh, these chambers and rooms and other places. So I would say this is kind of a small detail, but if you're actually trying to model a physical space, then I would say that this detail can be really helpful. Um, it's pretty easy to use. You just pick the room and they're pretty well named here that sounds like what you want to emulate. And there you go. Now, as far as this length control, um, what this is actually doing is, a, we said this is a multi-tap delay. This is actually adjusting the times of this multi-tap delay. And if I have it separated out with this pre-delay here, you're not gonna be able to hear it at all. The, the time adjustments are so small. You're really moving just like from, you know, milliseconds to a few more milliseconds. So let's get rid of this. And then you should be able to hear a little bit of impact from adjusting this length control. So let me bring this all the way down to zero. So very minor, but still something you can adjust. So after the early reflections have completed, and like I said, this is just a very short part of the signal. This is just gonna be a few milliseconds for the early sec reflections to complete. We'll move on to the tail section of the reverb, which happens third. And really all of the other controls on this screen are for adjusting the tail. So we'll have to turn up this ER tail mix so that we can hear the tail. And since we're focused on the tail, I'll just um, go ahead and turn this up to 100%. And I'll turn these early reflections off. We just won't use them. So now we can hear the tail of the reverb. So the first parameters we'll take a look at are uh, time and room size over here on the left-hand side. So time controls the overall decay of this tail of the reverb, how long it will last before it gradually fades out into silence. So we can crank this thing up. So this time is kind of like a bass time. There are other things that can affect this control. Um, and one of them is actually right above it, this room size control. So if you, for example, take this room size down to something really small, you're actually gonna have too small of a room for this time to actually elapse. And you're not gonna hear the full 7.6 seconds here. So that's one of the things that can affect it. The other thing that this room size, and this is just a scale from zero to 100%, it doesn't really actually give us a great sense of how big the room might be. But the other thing this controls is how much time it takes for a reverb signal to bounce from say one wall to the other. So when we talk about some of these other controls, I'll come back to this room size. There is a way to hear uh, a lot more clearly what this is doing. So next up, let's talk about these room controls over here, ambiance and density. So what ambiance does, it's kind of like an attack or a fade in for your actual reverb signal. 
And again, let me turn this pre-delay up here so that we can hear this a little bit better and what it's actually doing. Um, so if I set this ambiance control, and let's take that and set it down to zero, what's gonna happen is that this reverb is gonna kinda come back and just hit me all of a sudden. It's gonna smack me in the face. And if I take the ambience control and turn it all the way up, what we're gonna hear is that this reverb kinda smoothly fades in. So that's a really nice control for shaping the overall sound of your reverb. Uh, and definitely different kinds of rooms could have a different kind of ambiance to them. I kind of picture the, um, the low end of the scale being a very uh, square, hard room. The upper end, maybe there's a lot more curves and things like that that um, really uh, cause that reverb to fade back in more slowly. Let's leave this turned down for a while and also let's get rid of this pre-delay and take a look at the density control. So the density control controls the amount of buildup of the individual reverb reflections. So up here at 100%, you're gonna get something that sounds like a very smooth reverb. The individual reflections are gonna build up over time and you'll continue to hear them. If we go the other direction with this control, then the individual reflections are gonna decay really quickly. And you're gonna get something that sounds a lot more like individual echoes, kind of more of a fluttery reverb. Let's have a listen to that. You can kind of hear the individual echoes bouncing off the walls there. And I told you we'd come back to this room size control. Um, this is a really good way to hear this if you have the density all the way down and then we start adjusting this room size. Take a listen to what happens to, as the echoes kind of bounce off of the reflective surfaces. So if I turn this way down, it happens really fast. Up here at room size 100%, you can definitely hear it's taking a lot more time for those reflections to bounce around the room. Let's move on to the second tab here for the high and low frequencies. And if I have a pro tip for today, it is don't skip this tab. This is some really powerful sound shaping tools that we have on this tab. So it's divided into two sections. We've got the high frequencies over here on the left and the low frequencies over here on the right. Um, there are these bottom controls that are really like shelving filters. So these are just designed to actually cut out the reverb sound. Um, in the case of high frequencies above this frequency and in the case of low frequencies below this frequency. So these really can have a drastic impact uh, on your sound and they're not really related to the controls above them. So let's take a look at those. So there's the high shelving filter. Uh, same thing with the low shelving filter. So those are used for just cutting the frequencies all together. Now if we move up to these next controls up here, we have a frequency control and a time control for both the low and high band. So for each of these, we can define where it starts. And what we're adjusting with this time control then is the decay time for these individual frequency bands. So before we said that um, there were multiple things that could affect this time control over here. And these are the other two things that can really affect that. So let's take a look at the uh, highs first and I can set this frequency control to be somewhere and anything above this will be affected by this time control. So I can really, for example, elongate the decay of the high frequencies here. Let's turn this down quite a bit and make sure I'm not cutting too much here. And let's listen to what happens as I adjust this time control from zero up to 100. So we can go upwards here and we can also really shorten the decay time of just these high frequencies. Mm -hmm. 
And we can do similar things with the low frequency controls. So again, let me make sure I'm not cutting too much. Yeah, 93 is good. And let's just bring this up a bit um, and affect frequencies above 1,000 hertz and listen to what happens as I move this time control up from 0%. So there's some very powerful sound shaping in here. You can make the reverb sound really brash and clangy uh, from anywhere from there to really boomy. And I know those aren't really desirable words or what you might be going for in a reverb, but I guess the point is that those are the extremes and you can use these to dial in any number of sweet spots in between. All right, last up, um, we've got these reverb controls here. Um, we've got an input and an output width, and these are just um, controlling the stereo field of the signal going into the reverb and the signal going out of the reverb. So I think they're pretty self-explanatory. Um, and then we've got this delay control down here, which I find this delay control to be kind of the oddball in this reverb. Uh, the reason that I say that, really all algorithmic reverbs are built up of a network of feedback delays and all pass filters and you know a bunch of other components. Really all of the controls on here have pretty friendly names, right? And I think they're like macro controls that adjust a bunch of different parameters within that delay of components. But specifically this delay component gives you direct access to the delay time of the reverb tail. So um, generally speaking, if you're trying to emulate a physical space, I would leave this set to zero milliseconds. Actually, if you go through any of these presets which are designed to emulate physical spaces, which are actually most of them, um, they all have leave this set at zero. But if you're going for more of a special effect, this delay control can be interesting. It's kind of like the pre-delay, except it only affects the tail section. And also, unlike the pre-delay, um, this pre-delay doesn't really have any feedback associated with it, whereas the delays within the tail section do, so it's also affecting that feedback. So let's just take a listen to what that does. If this video is helping you in any way, it would mean a lot to me if you'd reach out and hit the like button for me. It really gives me satisfaction to know that I am helping other people out with creating their music. Thanks for that. So let's talk about putting all of these controls together and how I would approach building a reverb from scratch. So really, I think, you know, there are two kind of major paths that you could take. One is that you're trying to emulate some kind of physical space. And by that, I mean, this is probably a reverb that you would either put on your main output track so that everything, your entire mix is affected by it, or maybe you would put this on a return track so that you're sending a lot of different instruments or tracks into this. So that's what I'm talking about with the physical modeling path. The other path that you could possibly take is creating what I'm gonna call kind of an effects kind of reverb. And this would be, for example, you're probably putting this on a channel track. Um, so maybe you have a key group that has a synth sound on it. And you want that reverb to really become kind of part of that synth sound, uh, just a, an overall quality of it. Or maybe you have um, a drum track and you want to take an individual pad and put a specific reverb on that to really make that sound stand out, that drum hit sound, uh, stand out and sound different from other things. So. When I say an effect type reverb, I don't mean that it necessarily has to be completely outlandish, um, but it's just kind of something special that you're doing for a specific track. So if you're looking at creating uh, a physical space modeling type reverb, um, I would avoid the delay control, and I would consider using these early reflections. These early reflections, like I say, are, are kind of a small detail, but I think they really can help to enhance the overall convincibility of that sound. You might also consider using this pre-delay, and we talked a little bit about um, how to set that up. Um, I'm not a huge fan of pre-delay. Um, I will use it once in a while, but sometimes it kind of gives me the impression that I'm like sitting in a room and you know listening to a band in like a basketball stadium that has terrible acoustics, and I just happen to get some really crappy seats. <laughs> so um, if I do use this, I did give you kind of a guide for the speed of sound and maybe how you might think about setting this up. I will tend to go kind of light on this. If I can get away with using a smaller value, I will. And typically when I do use it, I will also temper it with some ambiance over here. And remember, ambiance is kind of controls that attack or fade in of our uh, reverb sound. 
So if I'm using some pre-delay, I will frequently use ambiance so that this pre-delay doesn't come back and just, you know, smack me in the face um, all at once. You can use pre-delay for like a slapback kind of effect. And I think there's a preset in here somewhere that is like, um, yeah, a slapback effect in here. I don't tend to use reverbs for that. If I want a slapback effect for like a vocal or a guitar, I'll tend to use either the air delay plugin or maybe like the Akai um, sync analog delay, which is like a bucket brigade delay for that. Um, but you can try it out. So after I've decided whether to use early reflections and pre-delay, I'll typically adjust the room size and time first. Um, I'll now just set those to some base values that I think sound good. Um, as far as the early reflections, if I'm going to use those, I'll typically set this mix to about 50% and I'll set the length somewhere between 50 and 75. And I'll just use that as some kind of a starting point. Um, and I'll maybe come back and adjust it later if I feel like it. The ambiance and density controls are almost always worth messing with. You can really do some serious sculpting of how your reverb sounds with these controls. As I already mentioned, um, I always come in and adjust these high and low frequencies. Even if I'm just choosing a preset here, um, I'll still come back in and see what I can do with these, at least, um, the, at least the shelving filters here on the bottom. And by the way, I mean, if you're setting this up as like a main reverb uh, on your main track or you're setting it up as a return track and you set it up kind of early and then you start adding some instruments to it like it may sound good um, initially when you do it but as you start adding more instruments you can actually create a lot of mud in this reverb that is just you know taking up space in the spectrum that could be used to enhance the clarity of other instruments so i definitely think um, it's worth coming back here later on as you near the end of your project and completing things to at least come back in here and take a look at these cut controls and see if there's any space that you can reclaim to make other instruments stand out. Like I mentioned, the delay control, I don't really use this at all for modeling physical spaces. However, if you're going for more of an effects type reverb and you want something that's a little bit out of the ordinary, then by all means, you can get some interesting stuff out of this delay control. You can create some very surreal spaces that don't really exist in nature. Or, you know, maybe it's like um, Superman's icy fortress of solitude, what it would sound like uh, with, if your music was in that room. Uh, the input and output controls, um, I don't tend to mess with the input width all that much unless I've got like a, a really hard pan kind of signal coming in here. I may reduce it a little bit or if I've got a very monophonic signal, maybe increase it a little bit. Um, the output, I mess with a lot. I <laughs> mean, that's just something that you're going to have to dial into taste um, and you'll be able to hear you know, pretty clearly what it's doing. Um, but definitely that's something that I play with toward the end. All right, I hope this has been helpful for you. I think that's about all I know about Air Reverb. Like I say, this is an older plugin, but I, I think it's really a solid choice, and I think it's stood the test of time quite well. Um, there are definitely some fancier reverbs out there these days that um, have some other interesting things attached to them, but just for an all-purpose reverb, I think this fits the bill a lot of the time and works well. If you'd like to learn more about using this Air Reverb as a send effect, which is a really powerful and flexible way to set it up, then check out this video over here. If you'd like to learn more about the Akai Force and MPC in general, then I've got this growing playlist over here, which you can pick your poison. There's a lot of content in there at this point and trying to add more all the time. That's all I've got. I really appreciate you hanging out with me today. This is Joe. I'll catch you next time.